Shalom Chavarim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic insight of our broadcast this evening. And let me say before we get started on this broadcast tonight, Babylon is rising. Friends, you're going to want to really share this video everywhere you possibly can. And because I feel like some of the things that we're bringing out here are very vital, I think if there's any way possible, you can get out there share this not in, only in social media, but even you have free advertisement type media that is all over the internet, such as Craigslist. Take on there and share IsraeliNewsLive.org with your friends. Set, set it out there. Put a, put a note on there somewhere. Anything you can possibly do to spread the word because what we're going to say and what we even produce on national television is not skim milk. We're telling you just like it is. And, you know, guys, I know there's a lot of people out there that I, I have to say they're, they're like imposters. You know, they come out, they tell you they're, 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 whether they be Israeli or Jewish or whatever, and they're, they're bringing out the typical same old Vatican propaganda to the world and trying to get people to support Israel and that type of atmosphere. I'm just not here to do that. I'm going to tell you just like it is. I'm not here to, to sugarcoat the story, because why? I know that the Mashiach is coming to Israel. I know that the Jewish people are in their homeland. Modern day Israel is where the house of Judah had to come to first in order to make reconciliation for what happened 2,000 years ago. But at the same time, I also know that Satan is there and Satan is trying to bring about a false Messiah to the Jewish people. And he's doing it under the name of religion. And at the same time, what is happening is that Rome has sent out emissaries to the churches. Rome has sent out people that are in sheep wolves and sheep's clothing that are telling you that this particular status quo that they're doing, well, that's normal. And they come in among you, they're in part, they're in the evangelical circles and they're in the messianic circles and everything else you can imagine. And the people are falling for these lines, hook, line, and sinker. And you have no idea that right under your nose, Satan is rebuilding his Babylonian kingdom. Everybody looks at Russia as the big, evil, bad guy. Well, you know, I don't say that Russia is some knight in shining armor either. You know, it's kind of interesting, though. There was an article that came out on the Washington Post just the other day that Putin said whoever controls AI, artificial intelligence, in other words, transhumanism, that will be the one that will rule the world. Hmm. Interesting. I guess you did see the video that Yana did here on Israeli News Live about transhumanism. Just keep in mind how they're going to achieve that. And he knows good and well they'll rule the world. Why? Because they'll have control of your body. Anyway, I'll try to get Yana to speak on that before too long. Let's get right into this broadcast. Some incredible things that the Holy Spirit revealed to me the other day that just blew me away. And I wanted to share this with you. We're going to start here in Revelation chapter 17 verses 4 through 7. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. You know, friends, let me tell you something. This is a serious woman right here. This is not just any kind of woman. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. And a lot of people are looking to some future event where the Christians will be put to death. Well, let me tell you something right now. As Rome works to move forward with her reviving of her mystery Babylon empire, she's doing exactly that. Well, no, it's not the priest or anything like that going through the Middle East that are killing the people. But believe me, the beast that carries her is carrying out the commands that she's given. Because see, this woman, which is generally represented as a church, is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. 
So it's not just been in this day that we're living in now, but down through the last 2,000 years. How many Christians have been put to death? We, think, we talk a lot of times about the Holocaust and all the Jews that were put to death, six million Jews that were put to death in the Holocaust. But how about the Christian martyrs? 200, what is it? I forget the number of them, two million or something like that. I forget, no, no, it's more than that. I, I forget the number now, but it is a staggering number of Christians. 66 million, that's what it was. 66 million Christians that have been put to death under the hand of Rome. The Vatican. No, we're not talking about Constantine in this case here. We're talking about the Vatican itself. 66 million Christians put to death. That's, in, that's recorded, I believe, in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. All right? So anyway, so she's drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, right? And she's, got, and, and she's carried by this, by this beast, which to me is a kingdom, a military empire, is what I believe that actually represents. Now, I went into this subject the other day about Israel's religious military exemption law is unconstitutional. Supreme Court, uh, the, the religious community has really come up against this law that requires the Orthodox community to uh, participate in military service. Now, RT actually was one of the many sources that covered it. They said Israel's Supreme Court has annulled a law which exempted the ultra-Orthodox Jews from being conscripted into the army drawing furious responses from the community leaders and some politicians. The decision to appeal the law was made Tuesday. Eight of the nine judge panel ruled that parts of the conscript law were unreasonable and un unconstitutional. The measure will take effect within a year. Members of the ultra-Orthodox community, unlike secular Jews who are drafted into the military at the age of 18, are largely exempt from being drafted into the country's armed forces. But as I stated before, the Orthodox community should be standing with the IDF. And I cited the passage here from Exodus. Now, friends, understand, I, I realize that, that God gave commandment for the Levites not to be involved in battle. When Joshua goes in to take the land, they're, they're commanded not to be involved in the battle, but to be involved in, in those uh, in, involved in the religious affairs of Israel. All right, that was their job, and I appreciate that. But what I'm talking about is a situation when we see idolatry that is creeping inside of Israel, we must stand and do something about it. And I'm not necessarily saying every, every Levite or every Orthodox uh, Jew go put on a sword per se, because the battle is not so much as bad with our neighbors as it is inside the camp of Israel. We have idolatry that has crept back inside of Israel, just like it was 3,500 years ago when Moses was up on the mountain and Aaron was dealing with the people and suddenly they forget that Moses is there. They, as they said, we don't know what happened to this guy Moses. And that's what's happening today. Moses is not here to direct the children of Israel, so therefore they just do whatever they think is right. And finally, Moses says, those of you that are on the Lord's side, stand with me. And the Levites actually stood up. And I think it's time for the Orthodox community to take a stand because why? Idolatry is creeping back into Israel. And you don't have to go strap on your sword, per se, as far as a... Ooh, what happened to the screen? And you don't have to go and strap on a sword per se, as far as a physical sword, but we have to deal with the idolatry. And my rabbinical brethren, I will share with you Paul, who was actually a Pharisee himself, and the Orthodox community today are descendants of the Pharisees. This is according to Rabbi Tobia Singer. So he was one of your own before he converted to Christianity. But watch what he says here in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 to 12, excuse me, chapter 11, verses no, 11 to 12, and then also verse 17. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he goes on to say a little further, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So when you strap on your sword, in this case here, it's the sword of the Spirit. 
It's the word of God. Wake up to who you are, my Orthodox brothers. Wake up to who you are so you can recognize that the enemy is bringing in a false Mashiach. You know this. My gosh, Daniel told us that there would be a prince that shall come, and he's not a Mashiach. He's not an anointed one. He's just a Nassim. Is that, is that what you want? Do you not see that when Daniel speaks about a revived empire, Daniel's feet, when it goes down to the iron, the feet get down there and it's iron and clay mixed together? As my wife so eloquently put it, transhumanism, clay. We are made up of the clay. The iron is from the nanobot technology they're trying to put in you. And you have Vladimir Putin stating in, in, a, in, a, in a town hall meeting in Russia that whoever controls the AI, the transhumanism, will control the world. And that's what it's coming to. And here, a president of a nation telling you this is about to happen. You better wake up. I know there's a lot of people out there, you know, they say, well, Steve, you know, you don't stand with Israel and, and, and la da 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 No, let me tell you something. No, I stand with Israel. But let me tell you something. When you talk about what's going on in Syria and, and, and Iraq or, or, uh, or uh, Iran and places like that, I'm not so much concerned about Iran, but when it comes to Iraq, Syria, and, and places like this here, all the evil that is happening in these countries here is going right over you and you're not seeing that they're reviving the Babylonian Empire. The same Babylonian Empire that when Jehoiakim was the king over, over Judah, he was under a Babylonian Empire. And he only lasted three years. Okay? Three years. While Babylon controlled all the way from the Nile River to the Euphrates River. Have you ever noticed how that the Arab Spring toppling Egypt, overthrow them, put the government in you want. Now Syria, Iraq, all that's been done. Why? The entire region. And Lebanon is on the list too, don't forget. And I realize Hezbollah is a problem for Israel. You have to understand, friends, I care about my people. I don't like Hezbollah being around them. I don't like Iran being around there. And I understand, okay, they bombed a, a facility there that's supposed to be, uh, they're building bombs and stuff like that. Well, maybe they are. But if you expect me to stand with Prime Minister Netanyahu unconditionally on every, every aspect that he does, and at the same time, you know he's bringing in the gay parades into Jerusalem, and you want to say that this is of God, then something is wrong somewhere. That's not of God. God is, in, is with his people, and he has brought them there for repentance. And the Bible says that the ten people of the nations will take over the skirt of a Jew and say, show us your ways, we hear God is with you. Right now, I don't see God with my people in that respect. Something's going to happen to them. Their eyes will come open and they will recognize that Yeshua is the Mashiach. Then we will know that God is with them. But in the meantime, they're trying to bring in a false Messiah. And nobody seems to be paying any attention to that. Why? So the rise of the Rome, rise of Rome, mystery Babylon, as we're going to get into this. I've got to share with you some incredible insights that the Lord has revealed to me about this. And, you know, like I said already, you have to be careful. Rome has a lot of agents out there. We've been infiltrated as well, more than once. Seemingly to be good people only to be agents of the Vatican, time and time again. All right, so let's look at something. I gotta, I gotta share something with you here. We're gonna go back, We're gonna. this is just off of the uh, U.S. Department of State, their archive. It's something you can easily pick up off of the UN's website as well. On November 29th, 1947, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a Resolution 181, also known as a Partition Resolution that would divide Great Britain's former Palestinian mandate into Jewish and Arab states in May in 1948. Under the resolution, the area of the religious significance surrounding Jerusalem would remain under international control administered by the United Nations. 
That sounds a lot like the uh, while the Oslo Accords are going on. It sounds a lot like what uh, Shimon Perez negotiated out with the Pope of Rome, Pope John Paul II, doesn't it? And as you can see, according to the map here, maybe it's a little hard to see there, but there's a white circle here around Jerusalem. And they say in there, under the resolution, the area of religious significance surrounding Jerusalem would remain under international control. UN mandate. Remember what uh, the late Joe Bainerman said about this, that Rome intends to get control of this? Well, that's the way the map was going to look. And actually, Gaza wasn't just that little strip right there on the coast. They were going to get a whole lot more land there. But the Arabs did reject it. But it wasn't, here's the funny thing, it wasn't just the Arabs that rejected it. And this is what I really got to bring home tonight, friends. You know, Israel, the country of Israel, is made up more than just one particular party of the government. It's more than just the Likud party. And it's more than just the house of Judah. As we get the name Israel, I always have taken it from when our forefather, Jacob, Yaakov, wrestled with the angel and he overcame, he prevailed, and as a result, he would not let the angel go until he blessed him. And when he did, he changed his name to Yisrael. And many people translate that as a prince with God or one that strives with God. There's a different, different ways it can be translated. There's some debate amongst scholars on how the translation of that should actually be. But my point being here is that we have the name of Israel today, Israel, because we are 12 tribes of Israel. But what's going to shock you is how the name of our current state came to be. Now, I think it's a great name for the country because it should represent the 12 tribes of Israel, including the house of Judah and the house of Israel, but all 12 tribes coming back, all right? But you'd be surprised. That wasn't the way it was planning on going. And you're going to be shocked to find out who was involved in making sure the name Israel became the name of Israel. And this is what the Holy Spirit revealed to me the other night. I'm sitting at my desk working on the subject because the Lord had revealed to me as well, go look up Euphrates River. And I knew about the angels being bound in the Euphrates. I knew about this. I knew that they would be loosed. I knew all of that. I realized that. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me go. He kept saying, go back, look up the Euphrates River. Then I found out why. And while I was working on that, I'm sitting, I'm going to sit, as I walk to my desk to go to sit down, the Holy Spirit come upon me and the Holy Spirit sh shared with me and showed me exactly how they came up with the name Israel. I was blown away. I'm like, I'm speechless. All right. On this particular uh, website here, UPI, uh, back on September 19th, 1982, uh, the prime minister at the time is Menachem Begin. Uh, by the way, those of you probably know the name because of... Uh, 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 Mike, um, I can't think of Mike's last name right now, but the, he was a journalist, a Christian journalist that actually went and uh, met with uh, 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 Menachem Begin, uh, the prime minister there. And we'll, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, the article says here, uh, Israel and the Vatican, new tensions over the, holy name, over the Holy Land. Vatican City, Pope John Paul II and Israeli minister Menachem Begin have never met and given Yasser Arafat's visit to the Vatican this past week, perhaps never will. Relations between Israel and the Vatican never have been smooth, but they plunge to their lowest depths uh, ever... Uh, Ever Wednesday, when John Paul embraced the smiling leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the Jewish state's blood enemy. All right, continuing on in the same article, if either John Paul or Begin had been thinking a, a personal encounter might be useful in the sorting out of their differences, the Pope's meeting with Arafat put such possibility to rest for the foreseeable future. The Pope's talks with Arafat triggered a uh, vit vitrolic. Israeli reaction, including a charge the Vatican had stood idly by as the Nazis massacred six million Jews during World War II. We're going to be going into that tonight. The Vatican rejected the charge as an outrage to the truth and bluntly told the Israelis their criticisms were, were incredible as well as unacceptable. 
though such public hostility usually is reserved for sworn enemies, the past week's exchanges between the Vatican and Israel were only the latest in a series of increasingly bitter uh, disagreements between them. Now keep this in mind, as we're reading this article right here about Prime Minister Begin when he was in office back in the late 70s, early 80s there, um, it's completely changed since then. Uh, Shimon Perez got the good relations going with the Vatican. We see uh, Pope Francis in good relation with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Everything's all hunky-dory going on right now in Israel. But it wasn't always that way. And in fact, until uh, Prime Minister Begin came into office, things were going pretty good for the Catholic Church before then as well, as you're going to find out, all right? I just wanted to bring that out. We are looking at an article from 1982, okay? So let's continue on. The Vatican, since the first crusades against the uh, Muslims in the 11th century, has claimed a special say in the fate of the Holy Land. Its sometimes violent relations with Islam were transformed to a cool and often icy, icy attitude toward the Zionist movement when it established the modern Jewish state in 1948. Pay close attention to the next uh, paragraph. Even before Israel was established, the late Pope Pius XII set himself against a prime Zionist goal by declaring in 1947 that the holy city of Jerusalem should be internationalized rather than part of a single nation. You tell me Rome doesn't have control of what happens in the world. Then a year later, the UN Resolution 181 comes out and they draw their little map with Jerusalem totally encircled with a United Nations area. Let me tell you why Prime Minister Begin and Pope Pius are, are at this time, it wasn't Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II, why they don't get along. Because he didn't get along with Pope Pius XII either. He was the one man that was staunchly against Rome's involvement in Israel. And for good reason. Because the last time, as the Orthodox community is today, being many of them descendants of the Maccabee brothers, the last time they made a covenant with Rome, we ended up in a mess. And I think that Prime Minister Begin knew that's exactly what would happen once again. Now, Let's go to this next story here. This is from the book, Political Leadership, Nascent Statehood and Democracy, a comparative study. It's by uh, Ulk, Ulrika Moeller and Isabel uh, Scherenbeck. I don't know if I pronounced those names right, but forgive me if I did not. Uh, under this part of the book here, I just really want to focus on what's in the red box there, but I'll read a little, I'll read the first part in just the red box and we'll kind of stop there. You can read the rest yourself. The strategic struggle of the Israeli state project was a struggle between the labor Zionist movement and the revisionists as well as the ultra-Orthodox establishment. The struggle also compassed an ultra-movement uh, ultra struggle between Ben-Gurion and the labor Zionists uh, mainly Mapam military elite. As a national leader, Ben-Gurion took over the control of the ZO to facilitate the struggle for independence. He sought to bargain with the rival Zionist right-wing movement, Ergon. Ergon was the right-wing right -wing movement, and it was. Menachem Begin was the leader of that group, one of the leaders. And the non-Zionist ultra-Orthodox establishment, he initiated substantial compromises with the ultra-Orthodox establishment in the status quo letter. The letter granted the ultra-Orthodox authority and rabbinical courts control over certain areas of specific concern to the ultra-Orthodox community. All right. Now, and, and also education and other areas there. So before the state of Israel began, we already had a division. We had three different groups that were battling. All of these groups were battling for control. All right. Now, sadly enough, uh, one of those groups had already been working with Rome from the very beginning. And we're going to show that tonight. The other group, the Ergon group, they didn't care about what Rome's desire was. 
but there was definitely a political motive behind this. Now, I know this myself from my own experience, not my experience directly with them, but I, I became friends with the Bielski family. Many of you remember the movie Defiance with Daniel Craig. Uh, the Bielski family, their second son, I, think, I don't think Michael is the oldest, I think he's the second son, Michael Bielski became good friends. I met Michael many, many years ago now, and we ended up sharing a lot in common uh, because one, being Jewish, second, uh, his father and his rescue of the Jews from, from uh, Belarus, him and his brothers, how they had rescued over 1,200 Jews during the Holocaust. Oddly enough, the Lord had revealed to me an incredible story, which I wrote the book Yom Su from that, and it entailed his own father. So we spent much time together, and he shared a lot of things with me about what his father went through during the time of uh, uh, resisting the Germans, as well as what his father went through when he went to Israel. Because he was recognized as a leader, uh, a military leader, not only rescuing so many Jews, but also fighting against the Nazis, he was uh, asked to help fight to liberate the state of Israel uh, from, from the British, which it really wasn't so much a liberation from the British, but it was to make sure that the Arabs couldn't get control of the land because the British were just backing out. But he wanted to be there for the War of Independence. Uh, not that uh, Tuvia wanted to be there for that, but he was there. And the Begin group, not Begin group, I'm sorry, uh, Ben-Gurion and the group that he was with, Moshe Sharit, these men here were all part of the military wing that was trying to establish the, the first Israeli defense forces, and they were supposed to work together with the Ergon group, but something fell through. Now, I know about what fell through because I remember Michael Bielski telling me. He said, they came to my dad and they didn't want this other group being able to get to Jerusalem. And he was told to kill anyone whether it be Jew or not, to try to take Jerusalem. Jerusalem was off limits. Why? That was because Ben-Gurion, our first prime minister, had already made a deal with the United Nations and with Rome that Jerusalem was off limits. You could fight for independence, but you couldn't fight for Jerusalem. And Menachai and Begin and the group that were part of the Ergon they came in with a huge ship with enough military equipment and supplies to take Jerusalem and men fighting power. But that wasn't to be. Well, oddly enough, I said this at a reconciliation conference in Israel back in 2015. And when I did, I had not met Avi Lipkin as of yet, but Avi Lipkin spoke after I did. And me and Avi, we become good friends afterwards. I spent many time, many hours talking together about things uh, privately, but he shared publicly, Avi shared publicly some of his thoughts as well of what happened, because when I shared the Bielski story, he knew about it as well. And I want to play a clip for you from what he said. Let's take a look. And about 26, 27 years ago, um, I'm, I, I, Steve is not here anymore, I understand. Okay. Uh, is Steve here? Oh, okay, good. Uh, you're the one from Alabama? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I spend a lot of time in Alabama, too. We'll talk later. Um, the story about the Bielski family, uh, basically, uh, forgive me for trying to add some more information to what you were saying. Uh, this country, and I talk about this in my book, The Bible Block, this country was controlled from day one by communists and socialists. These were the people who sank a ship called the Altalena. How many people heard of the Altalena? Altalena was a gun-running ship of the Irgun, which was right-wing and nationalist. And the orders to kill, they were telling Bielski to kill the Irgun people, which is Menachem Begin's group. And that was run by Ben-Gurion and, and, and Rabin. Rabin was the one who gave the orders to kill the, the Jewish sailors on board the Altalena in April of 1948. With the weapons that were on that ship that was sunk, we could have taken Jerusalem. We sacrificed Jerusalem in 1948 in order to sink a Jewish ship. 
because they were from the wrong political side. I was fired from the prime minister's office under Yitzhak Shamir, who was a right-wing Likud prime minister, by a socialist uh, administration. Thanks to the socialist administration, I have been in the Christian churches preaching for the last 26 years. So as we saw, Avi Lipkin was talking about, as I was as well, the Bielski family. And it was Daniel Craig, as you see here in the movie Defiance, that actually uh, played the character of Tuvia Bielski, uh, Michael Bielski's father, that I had the privilege of hearing so many remarkable stories from Michael uh, about his father and an incredible man. And what I really appreciated about him the most was the fact that when he was asked to actually attack the Jews and stop them from going to Jerusalem, he refused the order and would not be a part of it. Michael told me that his father said, I just spent the last six years of my life rescuing Jews and now you expect me to kill my own people who I spent the last six years of my life rescuing, he said, I will be no part of it. And he left the state of Israel, his beloved home, and where Michael was born as well, and he went to New York. Now, what troubles me is the fact that it, it lets us know, and I knew from Michael's own story that clearly there was someone involved in the early beginnings of Israel's politics that they wanted certain families in power inside of Israel to control the state of Israel politically so that they could determine Israel's future. And they were successful in the beginning. Now, as you can see here, Haaretz has actually had the story here, Altalina, as Avi actually speaks about here, burning off the coast of Tel Aviv. It is a tanker ship here. This had fighting men on board that had come to be part of the IDF in order to support the IDF in liberating the country and actually establishing a homeland for the Jewish people. And then Ben-Gurion refused to let him upset the status quo that Rome had already begun. Because remember, who did we discover that said that there must be, that Jerusalem has to be an international city? Pope Pius XII. Now right now, if you go online and try to look up about Pope Pius XII, every person you can think of is trying to rewrite history from how evil this man actually was and trying to make him look like some kind of saint. There's been about five or six different well-established journalists that have brought out the truth about this man. And I'm going to go into that in just a moment. But rabbis that are part of the sellout of the Jewish people, I can understand Catholic uh, scholars writing in favor of Pope Pius XII. I understand because they're Catholic, all right? And I realize that Pope Pius XII, he's been called Hitler's Pope by one author, and I agree with the author about this because I've done my own research about him. Uh, and the thing is, is what a lot of people don't realize is that there is a major movement right now amongst the Jews that the Vatican has control over that feel obligated to say something good about the, 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 the Vatican, that they're trying to rewrite history about him. I've seen that firsthand. I know, I even know of a documentary that was made putting him back in a good light. When the person that was involved in making the documentary, I knew them and I warned them and I told them this is false. It was propaganda. All right, now, in a book here by David Holm, Identity, Ideology, and the Future of Jerusalem, I want to read to you what was written right here. As the British mandate came to an end, Ben-Gurion worked to bring the Jewish military elements into one cohesive force. The Ergon agreed to join with the Haganah, the Palmach, and the Stern Gang from the, uh, for, to form the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, right? Begin, and Ergon agreed to do so within the boundaries of the Hebrew independent state, according to Shemuel Kotz, a revisionist propagandist and member of the Ger Ergon in Europe, at the time, this clause excluded Jerusalem, which was understood to be on the path to internationalization with Ben-Gurion's support, Kotz wrote. 
So yes, Ben-Gurion was part of the United Nations movement, the, the movement of Pope Pius II, very much under control of the Pope of Rome in making sure that Jerusalem went into their hands. In opposition to Ben-Gurion, Begin, that's Menachem Begin, who became Prime Minister in the late 70s, attempted in June 1948 to claim part of an intercept Ergon arms shipment on board of the uh, uh, excuse me, Altalina, for his Jerusalem contingent, Ben-Gurion was determined not to allow the Ergon or Begin to be a divisive element within the new state. The Altalina was shelled from Tel Aviv uh, foreshore and set on fire. Begin capitulated after the establishment of the state and with the formation of the parliament system began beca uh, became leader of the Harut party following the political philosophy of Yavinsky. He had forsaken armed opposition but not this perspective on Eretz Israel or Jerusalem in Harut press conference. A stain on the beginnings of Israel, the stain of the flag of the nation of Israel. The Ben-Gurion would actually be willing to kill the Jewish people to keep another military group that was willing to be part of the IDF all because they didn't want Jerusalem to be touched. The Pope wanted it. Very troubling. Why is Israel called Israel? And this is what the Holy Spirit began to reveal to me. Israel got its name not because it was actually the Jewish man's thoughts. It come from Rome. Now, again, I love the name Israel for the state of Israel. I think it's the most appropriate name it could be given. But I want you to see how this was actually happening. A brief history of the tribe and the word of Israel, how the modern state all, uh, almost came to be called something completely different. Hint, who is Isaac Pernoff? We may not be going into that, but let's, let's look at part of the article right here. How the modern state of Israel almost came to be named Sabra. Uh, they actually spelled it uh, T-Z-A-B-A-R, but it's actually Sabra, Sabra uh, which is what they call the Jewish people today. As for the modern state of Israel, its beginnings lie in the 19th century when the Jewish nationalist movement Zionists took shape. Members of the movement usually referred to the hope for a nation to be formed in Palestine as the Jewish state as it was called by Theodor Herzl in Germany, Der Judenstadt. During the British Mandate, Palestine, Palestine's office name in Hebrew was Eretz Israel. Now notice, the British Mandate called it Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. All right, now, as I said, that's the name it should be called because it should be showing a unification of both the House of Judah and the House of Israel as one nation. But you have to understand, that was done intentionally, though, with a preconceived notion of who the House of Israel already was. So that was the name that appeared in Hebrew alongside Palestine in English and Arabic and the local currency stamps and official documents lending the name Israel official status, all right? But on May 14, 1948, a couple of days before the British rule, over Palestine ended, the Jewish leadership in Palestine met in Tel Aviv, presided over by David Ben-Gurion, who would become Israel's first prime minister. The small group decided that a Jewish state would be declared independent on the day the British left. Then the small band turned to discussing what the name of, uh, to, the, to, the, to the name, to name the state. According to the only source extent from the proceedings in an article by Palestine Post writer Moshe Brilliant, Published a year later, at the first the group wanted to go with the name Judah, the name of the ancient Jewish kingdom. But this name was rejected after some discussion since most of the historic Judah fell outside the borders of the nascent state according to the United Nations partition plan for Palestine that was on the table at the time. In other words, well, it wasn't all Jews living in the area to begin with. Okay, so watch what they say here. The group turned to other possible names, among them Zion and Sabra, but some suggested Israel, and a vote was held. The name Israel won seven to three. As for who suggested the name, Brilliant said that it was Ben-Gurion himself. It is possible, however, that as he wrote a year after the event, he got this detail wrong. Moshe Sharit, 
Israel's second prime minister had been calling the future Jewish state the state of Israel in speeches at least since 1946, while Ben-Gurion was using uh, Midanat Hayudim, the state of the Jews. So it seems plausible that it was Sharit, not Ben-Gurion. In an interview in 1965, Ben-Gurion was asked who suggested the name, and he replied he didn't remember. So Moshe Sharit, he was the guy that they believe actually was the one that suggested the name of Israel, the second prime minister. Now, of course, as we can see, he's working with Ben-Gurion. He's part of that group that no doubt is in with the Pope. At least it would seem plausible to think so, especially after reading this article here in Har Haaretz. Well, oddly enough, there is more evidence that suggests the exact same. And this is being written not by John uh, uh, Cornwell, who actually wrote the book called Hitler's Pope that infuriated the entire world, but it was by a different man, William D. Uh, D. Rubenstein, who is a major critic and an apologet apologetics uh, professor. I don't want to call him a professor, actually, but an a, a author that writes in favor of Pope Pius uh, XII. Now, granted, I understand completely Catholic uh, uh, scholars standing up for the Pope of Rome. Uh, the Jewish people that are doing this, the rabbis that are doing this, that are the apologists as well, I believe that there is very much behind the reason why they're doing it. And it could be, it could be uh, status inside of Israel, the, the state of Israel. It could be uh, maybe repaying a debt because of maybe their families were rescued in the Holocaust. I don't know what the issue is, but it's definitely, we see that Rome's hand is very much involved in Israel. Watch what Moshe Sharit says in here about him. So at any way, uh, praising Priscilla's work in saving Jews during the war, Dr. Raphael Cantoni head of the Italian Jewish Community's Wartime Jewish Assistance Committee, stated that six million of my uh, choralogenists have been murdered by the Nazis. But there could have been many more victims had it not been for the uh, effectuous intervention of Pope Pius XII. Moshe Sharit, later Israel's second prime minister, met with Pius in the closing stages of the war and said, I told him that my first duty was to thank him and through him, the Catholic Church, on behalf of the Jewish public for all they had done in the various countries to rescue the Jews. We are deeply grateful to the Catholic Church. At Pius' death, there was a serious move in Israel to dedicate a forest in his honor, while Golda Meir, Israel's foreign minister, eulogized that when fearful martyrdom came to our people in the decade of Nazi terror, the voice of the Pope was raised for the victims. Now, it's oddly, as we've seen already, under Ben-Gurion, they were willing to kill the Jews. Ben-Gurion had Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, give the order to murder the Jews that were coming to liberate Jerusalem. And oftentimes we think about the establishment of the state of Israel. We think about Ben-Gurion being our first prime minister and we're excited about it. Uh, we think about Herzl and the vision that he had for a Jewish homeland. Uh, and all these things are exciting to, to us to hear these things and, and we're we're jubilant about it, having no idea what is behind the history of our country becoming a Jewish homeland and those Jews that were murdered just to keep the wish of the Pope a reality. And I'm not knocking the fact that there's no doubt there were many Jews that were rescued. I don't think Pope Pius XII had anything to do with it. They may be trying to make it look like he did, but I don't think, I think it's just to the contrary. And the very man, John Cornwell, that actually wrote the book that infuriated everybody, this is the book right here, Hitler's Pope, The Secret History of Pius XII. This man was actually in favor of the Pope when he started his research. He only uncovered an over surmountable amount of evidence that was to the contrary as I have listed some of the statements he put in here. And he's actually, since he's did a revision on the book after all the different apologetics have come out about standing up for Pope Pius XII, how wonderful he is, etc., 
He's come out and he's done another research and he says, I have to stand with what I found to start with. All right, and let me just share a little bit about what he says here. So Pasilli's influence in the Vatican began during the first decade of the 20th century and increased over the period of nearly 40 years until he was elected Pope in 1939. On the eve of the Second World War, it seemed to me that a fair appraisal of Pasilli's his deeds and omissions required a more extensive chronicle than an attempt that had been attempted so far. Such a study would expand not only Pacelli's earlier diplomatic activities, but on the whole life, including the growth of his uh, evident spiritually, uh, excuse me, spirituality from childhood. I was convinced that if his full story were told, Pius XII's pontificate would be vindicated. Hence, I decided to write a book that would satisfy a broad spectrum of readers old and young, Catholics and non-Catholics alike. So he was planning on writing a positive book. What does he say here though? I applied for the access to the crucial material in Rome, reassuring those who had charge of the appropriate archives that I was uh, the side of my subject, acting in good faith to key archivist, gave me the generous access to the unseen material. Dispositions under oath gathered 30 years ago uh, for Priscilla's beautification and also documents in the office of the Vatican Secretari Secretariat of State. At the same time, I started to draw together critical, the huge circuit scholarship relating to Priscilla's activities during the 1920s and 1930s in Germany and works published during the past 20 years, but mainly inaccessible to general readership. By the middle 1997, nearing the end of my research, I found myself in the state I can only describe as moral shock. The material I had gathered, taking the more extensive view of Pasilli's life, amounted not to the exoneration, but a wider indictment. Spanning Pasilli's career from the beginning of the century, my research told the story of a, of a bid for an unprecedented papal power that by 1933 had drawn the Catholic Church into complicity with the darkest forces of the era. I found evidence, moreover, that from an early stage in his career, Pasilli betrayed an undeniable uh, antipathy toward the Jews and it, his diplomacy in Germany in 1930s had resulted in the betrayal of the Catholic political associations that might have challenged Hitler's regime and thwarted the final solution. Just a little bit of what he says. Troubling, isn't it? But the apologetics are unbelievable. The rebuttals of his work are unbelievable. And yet he's only one of four other authors that have also wrote and found the same type of incriminating evidence against uh, Pope Pius XII. All right, now, so what's actually going on? What is happening? Now, as you can see the map here, looking at Egypt here, coming across this modern day Sinai, up through modern day Israel, uh, up here into Lebanon, then we have Syria, the state of Syria, you have Jordan, but watch the green here. This is the Babylonian Empire. All right, and it arches over, comes down into Iraq, all the way down, and stops just before we get to modern-day Kuwait. Isn't that kind of odd? We have conquered Iraq. We are working on Syria. And because it looks like Iran might be a little bit in the... Well, no, there's Nineveh right there, so I guess Iran's kind of out of that. Yeah, that, that's Iran over there, so Iran's out of the picture. But we have taken over Iraq. We're working on taking down Syria... And we're trying to get a Kurdish state that does come in the bottom of Turkey right there, as well as part of the eastern. You get the picture. Babylon is looking to revive. Isn't it interesting that the Bible says, And the kings of Egypt came not again anymore out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt and to the river of the Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. But oddly enough, this is what was promised to Israel. Remember what? Joshua said, from the wilderness into the Lebanon, even into the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and into the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your border. Okay? There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And in fact, God says to Abraham that he gives him all the way over there to the Nile River. So it, it never has ended. Rome is re reviving not only the Roman Empire, but the Babylonian Empire. And Jerusalem, they've not given up on Jerusalem yet. And I've shared this with you guys so many times. Uh, 
This is Giulio Miotti's article from December 15, 2011, the exp uh, expose, the Vatican wants to lay its hands on Jerusalem. And as we already know, peace negotiations in the Middle East must tackle the issue of the status uh, of the holy sites of Jerusalem. Cardinal Jean-Louis Toron, head of the Vatican Council for Interreligious Dialogue, declared several days ago in Rome, the Vatican's former foreign minister asked to place some Israeli holy places under Vatican authority, alluding to the cynical on Mount Zion in the Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Okay, the first I also have is what is referred to as King David's tomb. There will be no peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved, Tehran said. And there's not been any peace. So he's kept his promise there. But we know, though, that Pope Francis in 2014, he actually visits Jerusalem, the upper room, comes there. Uh, and as you can see, he's sitting here with his triple crown on, showing that he's the king of Israel. And the Pope never makes a foot onto soil unless he's already conquered it. Now, of course, Pope Francis was not the first one, but the mere fact that he actually drunk upon God's holy mountain, which I've shared with you guys too many, many times as well, the prophecy of Obadiah, chapter 1, only one chapter there, verse 16, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually, yea, they shall drink, and shall swallow down, and shall be as though they had not been. Ki ka'asha shutetem al kodeshi. See, for as, as uh, the, the, they, you have drank, that's masculine plural, upon the Kodeshi HaKodeshi, my holy mountain, Ishatu Kol HaGoim, and they, this is no longer masculine plural, but this is include, gender inclusive uh, plural, they, they, the nations would drink continually, Tamid, continually. So, the whole thing is, is the Pope of Rome has fulfilled biblical prophecy. He's taken over the land and he has found a ally amongst those early Jewish leaders. And that's interesting in itself. Orthodox rabbis issue groundbreaking statement on Christianity. All right. Now, this is, of course, the Jewish Congress that have done that. Who in the world is the Jewish Congress? Kind of like the Sanhedrin. Who in the world is this Sanhedrin? Oh, yeah, they put the Pope on trial, but they had an advocate for the Pope there, had already met the Pope. Nobody ever tells you about that. Very strong advocate for the Pope. But then they came come up with this Orthodox rabbi issued groundbreaking statement on Christianity, December 3rd, 2015, Vatican Radio, in concordance with the Nostra Aetate, basically galvanizing uh, the Jewish and not Christian, but Catholic Vatican agreement there, the Nostri Aetate. And so all these 25 prominent rabbis from around the world signed on, making Israel and the Vatican as one nation. But as we think about the map I shared with you a minute ago, about the revived Babylonian Empire, and, we, and just think for a moment, as I close in this broadcast, I want you to think about something. Syria. Have you ever thought about all the different nations that are involved to try to topple Bashar al-Assad? Now, there's basically three groups that are trying to keep him in power. Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah. I don't like Hezbollah at all because they're very much against the Israeli people. And I'm not that crazy about Iran either because they've talked about trying to annihilate the Jewish state. Russia, I have no problem with. I know some people think, well, this is the big bad boogeyman that's going to come down and destroy Israel. Russia has two million of their own citizens living in this country. I don't think unless they're forced into a, a, a fight, they're not just going to go and start one with Israel. They're allies with Israel at this point. But if you think about all the nations that are supporting, whether it be the Free Syrian Army, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, uh, the Kurds, everybody that is trying to overthrow the Syrian government, all those nations, we know who they are. But there's something that they have in common. Or let me just put it like this. We did a report months ago when Russia had destroyed an underground bunker, they had Qatar, Turkish, Saudis, American, Israelis, all these special forces involved that were there, right? They had all of that, all right? Then we know all the different nations that are fighting with the coalition that is there. We have the United States, United Kingdom. We still have Qatar is still involved. Saudi Arabia is involved. Uh, Germany is involved. France is involved. All these nations have been involved in one way or another. And quote-unquote, trying to defeat ISIS, or helping the opposition to overthrow 
the Syrian government, right? Well, here's something that I found that was very interesting is what they have in common, these countries and the overthrow of Syria. It's their friendship, all right? Starting, for example, Saudi Arabia, one of the biggest supporters of terrorism uh, in overthrowing the Syrian government, good friends with the Pope of Rome. Uh, we have Jordan's King uh, Abdullah and his wife, very good friends with the Pope of Rome. We even have Ben Ki-moon, United Nations head, very good friends with the Pope of Rome. Uh, we could jump over here as well, the former uh, French president, Holland, good friends with the Pope of Rome, even Erdogan, that they consider the renegade, the thug, so to speak, very good friends with the Pope of Rome. We have, of course, uh, Prince Charles of England, uh, good friends with the Pope of Rome and good standing, always bringing gifts to him and stuff. Then, of course, we have Angela Merkel, good friends with the Pope of Rome, and, and believe it or not, even Qatar. Qatar's Sheikh Moza uh, in a private audience with the Bint Nassar and the Pope Francis discussed the refugee crisis and the importance of education in the conflict zones. A friend of Rome, uh, the Pope of Rome, even President Donald Trump. I don't think the Pope's very happy about seeing him, but nonetheless, he's also, why? Because he started it with Barack Obama. And unfortunately, President Trump is involved in helping finish what they started. So the thing is, friends, when it comes to what's going on in Israel, I'm very concerned about it. And no, I don't support the gay parades that are marched in Jerusalem at the invitation of the government. I'm not supportive of that. I'm not supportive in our government at the beginning being willing to murder our own people just because they wanted to liberate Jerusalem. Now, we did get some good government officials in there because in the 1967 war, we did liberate the old city. But if you remember, Moshe Dayan gave the Temple Mount right back. Why? Because they have a lot of stronghold in the government as well. Although we have had some good ones like Menachem Begin, who was very much for capturing Jerusalem from the very beginning, but his comrades were murdered. So I'm not for that part of our government. I'll stand for the truth. And what's happening in Syria, this is not so much, we're just getting a lot of propaganda. And I don't doubt weapons and weapons factories, sure. President Bashar al-Assad is fighting a war for his life. But Rome is busy reviving the, uh, the Babylonian Empire. That's what he's reviving. He wants to rule the world. The Vatican is very much involved in the pharmaceutical companies. As what we said as we first came on about uh, the Russian president saying that whoever controls the AI will control the world. Because they will control the people of the world. This is what a new world order is all about. And they're getting ready to bring about a false millennial reign, a false messiah for Israel. And my question is, will you end up believing it? There's not many people willing to stand up and tell you the truth, but I will try to do exactly that. I will stand for my people. I will stand for what is true. But I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I'm not going to sit here and tickle your ears, as some that claim to be Jews will do. I will stand with the God of Israel and what's true. And I will fight with that sword. As Moses said, those that are with the Lord, stand with me and gird on your sword, which as Paul said, is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And I will tell you what the Word of God says and tell you the truth. If you stand with that type of ministry and want to support the work we do, we do need your help. And God knows that. And I believe that God will lay it on many people's heart to help us. Because things do get tight, especially when you're saying the truth. There's too many people out there condemning what we say and saying that we're just false and things like that to benefit themselves. But I would rather be poor and stand with the truth than to lie to you, to your face, lie to you, 
and make you think everything is okay, I'll stand for him. Thank you for your support, though, and we thank you for your prayers. And if you want to support this ministry, you can do so by going to our website, israelinewslive.org. You can support online there. Uh, even on our YouTube channel, above our subscribe button, if you're on Israeli News Live, now there's many channels that have permission to post our videos, but you have to make sure you're on Israeli News Live. You can also uh, donate there. And our address appears at the end of this video in Prague, Czech Republic. That's, we still have our address there. You can send a donation there if you prefer to do it by check or money order uh, to Danun Institute. Israeli News Live doesn't work as well because Danun Institute is the name of our institute. Uh, we are licensed as Israeli News Live. We just don't have a bank account with that name on it. Uh, but we thank you for that. If you would, we would really appreciate doing everything you can to share what we're doing with others, that it could be a blessing. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live.